get to this interview. Uh, Chris Christie joins us. He's got a lot to say, as always. Let's get right to him. Governor Chris Christie, welcome to the program. Happy to be here. Listen, you are not only an insightful guy when it comes into politics, but you're pretty entertaining, too. We've been pining to get you on the program here for a while just to sort of ballpark what we've got going on in Washington and what we can expect on the way to 2024 and beyond. But I, I have to start with the Biden administration. I know you follow this stuff quickly uh, or closely because of your day job, but what do you make of, of these guys in this progressive first hundred and some odd days? Well, look, it's a guy who has become um, a complete false leader. You know, he ran saying he was going to bring the country together, work with both parties, be a transitional president. And now he's decided he wants to be a transformational president. He wants to be FDR without a depression or a world war. Um, <laughs> we're spending more than we did to get out of the depression and the world war combined. And we don't have either of those problems. And in fact, he's just lied to us over and over again about, you know, when he got into office and since he's been there, um, you know, he calls the, um, uh, you know, the COVID package and COVID package, although 10% of the 1.9 billion is about health care. And we had just appropriated 900 billion, um, you know, a month or two before. He then says he's got a two and a quarter billion dollar infrastructure package, which best case, 25% is on infrastructure, what we define as infrastructure. Um, and, and now he, he has this whole new other program that the whole thing's going to cost $6 trillion altogether. This is not what the American people voted for. It's not what they want. And he's going to feel that and he's going to feel it soon. So what do you think of, do you think he basically just ran a Trojan horse campaign? Or do you think at some point after the election, he just decided, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to lose control of the leftists at some point. So we might as well just go down that tack from the very beginning. Yeah, I, look, and I think, you know, he couldn't run as a genuine lefty in the, in the primary because he couldn't have gone far enough left to out left Bernie Sanders or yeah, right. Elizabeth Warren. So what he had to do was tactically, he had to play the middle and say, you're not ready for that over there. But he also knew that that's where all the energy in the party was. That's where all of their energy was in the House of Representatives was on the far left. So I don't know whether he, he planned to, to, to have the whole thing be a sham or once he, got, once he won, he said to himself, well, if I'm gonna get anything done, I got to go here. And he knows he's only going to be there one term. I mean, I see him telling everybody he's going to run for a second term. I mean, you know, he won't be able to walk for a second term, let alone <laughs> run for a second term. So, you know, he knows it's one term. This is his shot. And for him, he probably knows he's got two years. Yeah. Because yeah. If, if history is any guide, he'll lose the house. So, you know, I think that's what's going on here, Josh. And I, and I don't, I think this is just Joe Biden being who Joe Biden is, um, who is a practical politician at the end of the day. He sees this as where the daylight is. He's running to the daylight. Yeah, that's pretty good analysis. That's the best I've heard. I, I, I'm going to ask you to put your governor hat on here because there's one economic problem in my view that stands out above all else, and it's the anemic jobs reports with the vast amount of spending over the last year, and yet we're now and supposedly having this breakout quarter, we only create a couple hundred thousand jobs. And, and most people are saying, all right, well, the, the federal unemployment plus ups are clearly a problem. People are making a logical economic choice not to seek employment because they're frankly getting paid more to stay at home. If you got that gov hat on, you're looking, you know, in your former capacity, a lot of governors from red states are saying, thanks, but no thanks, we're going to turn this stuff off. What, what do you think you'd do under those circumstances? Well, you know, in New Jersey, it would be tough, right? Yeah. I'd have, a, I'd have a Democratic legislature who would be pining to take all this money and spend it, right? Right. Um, and so, but, but I would say to folks, look, what do you want to do here? We're going to have a huge economic and budgetary cliff to deal with if Biden continues the way he's going. Because people, listen, New Jersey's unemployment rate's at 7.8% as we sit here today. Um, it is in a in very bad way because our governor completely overreacted to the COVID stuff. Um, no nuance to his policies. This is a guy who still has a mask requirement in effect as we speak right now. He says that you know he's got to look at the CDC stuff. He's he was a bond salesman for Goldman Sachs. I mean, what the hell does he know? Uh, he's going to analyze it now. 
or 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 his ex excellent health commissioner, who's the woman who crafted the policy to put COVID patients back into nursing homes. Yeah, right. Let's remember something, Josh. New Jersey, for instance, is is under such a lag for two reasons. One, because Phil Murphy and his policies killed more people than in any state per capita in the nation. That's incredible. Third, and it, how come that never gets any publicity? How come nobody ever says anything to that? Yeah, well, the reason they don't is because everybody's Cuomo obsessed, right? Yeah. So the national media is Cuomo obsessed. It's been the greatest gift to Phil Murphy ever. And the Republicans have been Cuomo obsessed. And I keep trying to tell them, our election comes first. Right. Our election comes this November. If you want to send a message to the whole country, defeat Phil Murphy in November. You Like I defeated John Corzine in 2009. Oh, that yeah. The entire stage for 2010. And so I, I don't, I, listen, Murphy killed more people than any other governor per capita in America. And right now, India may be catching up, but <laughs> more than any political subdivision in the world. That's incredible. Yes, yeah, and, and yet no attention. I mean, is that, I look back at your race in 09, both you and McDonald basically paved the way from an electoral standpoint to what the huge gains we saw in 2010. We're seeing in Virginia much of that same sort of environmental shift. Now, I don't, I don't know, it's a lot bluer state than it used to be. What's your look at New Jersey? I mean, is that going to be a competitive race, you think? It should be a competitive race. Um, you know, it's going to, listen, psychologically, you know, Jack Chitarelli, there's a primary, there's three people in the primary, but I think Jack Chitarelli is a former assemblyman who ran four years ago and lost in the primary. Um, I think he's probably the nominee. But in New Jersey, you have to be funded. Yeah. You know, we're in the New York and Philadelphia media markets. So it's the first and fourth most expensive markets. You have to be able to be funded. I think if Chitterelli can max out, we have a public funding system. So if he can max out, um, you know, then I think that would give him about $12 million to spend in the general election. I, I think that would be enough for him to really make a dent. But is he going to be funded? He has not been very well funded in the primary. Mm -hmm. And this is where the psychological stuff really helps for 2022 also to win in 21, because what it showed donors was that, oh, man, we can win. Because remember, people were so down after 08 with Obama. Oh, yeah. Yep. 60 seats in the United States Senate. I mean, they, they were they were crushed. And then all of a sudden, McDonald and I come back and win in 09. And people say, oh, wait a second. Maybe we could do something. And that not only recruits better candidates, it also funds those candidates better. No so question. I think New Jersey, we got a shot. Um, I think Jack Chitterelli can be a candidate who could win, um, but he's got to be well-funded. And that's going to be a decision ultimately, not only for New Jersey donors, but for national donors. Are you going to get in here and you're going to help this guy get funded? Uh, if they do, I think Jack's got a real legitimate chance. Because let me tell you, there's so many issues to run against Phil and Murphy on. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's breathtaking. He's raised taxes every year. He, it, how about this? Think about just one stat. In my eight years as governor, state spending went up 5% total in eight years. Right. In his four years, spending has gone up 29%. Unbelievable. It's breathtaking. Unbelievable. And, it, and the people in New Jersey know that ultimately that bill is going to be dumped at their door. Right. Right. No, no question about it. A lot of vulnerabilities there. And it feels like the environment's shifting a bit. I mean, I, anecdotally speaking, you see people across the country, conservatives beginning to turn out. You saw the special election in Texas where not just the Texas six, but all kinds of undercard uh, school board elections and the like come conservatives way. It happened in Nebraska. It's happening kind of everywhere. I mean, is that your assessment? It feels a little bit like conservatives are coming back together in a pretty strong way here. Yeah. And listen, the way to do it, and this is what I, why I've continued to say the things I'm saying is we got to stop looking in the rear view mirror. 2020 is over. Yeah. Now look, I don't know everything that happened in the election, but I know this much. Joe Biden's living in the White House. He's signing executive orders and he's speaking before joint sessions of Congress. He's the president. And, and what he's doing is going to be irreversible if we let it happen. So conservatives should be uniting in their opposition to these policies, which, by the way, you know, there's no conservative. I don't care where you are on the spectrum, whether you're Lee Stefanik, you know, or, or whether you're Jim Jordan. I don't care where you are on the spectrum. These policies are ones that we don't agree with. And so what I think we need to be doing is uniting against Biden and Harris. And if we unite against Biden and Harris, that brings the party together in what we're against. 
and then we will work out what we're for once we get authority. But we've got to stop these folks, and we got to stop looking in the rearview mirror. 2020 is over, and we've got to stop worrying about what happened in 2020. Stop arguing about it. Who want, do, you, do you really want to see another leadership fight in Washington? No. Anybody in America cares? <laughs> Nobody gives a damn, whether it's Liz Cheney or Lee Stefanik. They probably, most people in America don't have any idea who Lee Stefanik is. Right. And Liz Cheney, you know, the only reason they know her is because she's Dick's daughter. Yep. Maybe. Yep. Maybe. Yep. So let's stop already. Who wants to hear Kevin McCarthy talking about leadership fights anymore? I don't. <laughs> I mean, and the American people don't either. They're like, wait a second, Joe Biden is, Israel is, Israel is burning, right? We're pulling out of Afghanistan, which I think is an enormous mistake and is going to come back to bite us. The Chinese are running roughshod over us. We're paying ransom to keep a pipeline open. And we're worried about whether it's Liz Cheney or Lee Stefanik. <laughs> hey, Josh, wake me when it's over, man. Totally. There are problems we should be dealing with here. No, no question. I mean, look, and all of this is, we've argued on Ruthless, it's all a concerted effort by the press uniting with the Democratic Party to try to distract you from the real stuff that happens, right? I mean, you can't find a headline on CNN that doesn't deal with the leadership divide. And, and just as you said, nobody gives a shit. No. I mean, this is, this is ultimately a, a New York and DC punditry talking to each other while some really pretty consequential stuff is happening enormously consequential stuff is happening and that's what we as republicans have to be united to stop and and that's what's going to bring the party back together is a forward-looking opposition to the biden agenda and then a development of an agenda look we're only 16 weeks into the biden presidency so we shouldn't be expected to have a unified republican agenda this soon this doesn't happen what was the unified democratic agenda in january 17th except, or, or may have 17, rather, except impeach Donald Trump. Yeah, I mean, right. you know, other than that, I was living through that, you know, Russian, you know, the Russian collusion and impeach Donald Trump. They didn't have any program. So right. let's, not, let's not let the press hold us to a different standard. I can tell you what the Republican Party is for. We are for opposing Joe Biden's $6 trillion in spending. We're for opposing, uh, you know, his horrible policies in the Middle East, which is already causing war in the Middle East, which didn't happen during Donald Trump's four years. I mean, those are the things we're for. And, and you know, I saw the New York Times yesterday, Josh, their headline was, you know, something to the effect of, you know, conflict in the Middle East undercuts Trump's, yes. you know, undercuts Trump's policies, Trump's policies. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Hamas wasn't shooting any rockets when Donald Trump was in office. I know it. I mean, it would be hilarious if it wasn't just so ridiculous. It's like a parody. It's absurd. You know? And and you know what? We have to continue to remind people. I don't know. There there weren't people rushing over the border in the South when Donald Trump was president. Yeah. There weren't people killing each other in the Middle East. Hamas was not reasserting itself in the Middle East when Donald Trump was president. Instead, we had the Abraham Accords. I mean, yeah. look. Like everybody else, I'll have my differences from a policy and a personnel perspective with the president, uh, President Trump. But you look at these first 16 weeks of Biden. Let me tell you something. Jimmy Carter, 2.0. Yeah, it is. When, well, you saw, when I saw that picture of he and, and, and his wife with uh, President and Mrs. Carter. Now, look, very nice of him to go and visit President Carter. I have great respect for anybody who's held that office. But I mean, I can't <laughs> wait for that picture to be used in 2024. Yeah. I can't, yeah. can't wait. I mean, it's like, can it come now? So we can use the picture now? <laughs> totally. Totally. It was amazing. Well, let's talk 2024 a little bit because we saw your name in the headlines heading down to a big confab in Austin, Texas, where a bunch of, you know, what people think are, are rumored 2024 candidates yourself included, you're getting a lot of buzz around town as somebody who's considering it. Are you thinking about running for president in 2024? I certainly won't preclude it, Josh. I mean, I think it's good. It's one of the luxuries of having done this once before is you realize what matters and what doesn't. Right. And when you're doing it for the first time, you really don't know. You think you know, but you don't. <laughs> um, what, what happens in 2021 is of little relevance for the most part for candidates. 
uh, or potential candidates. And so for me, what I want to do is to try to lead the party in a productive and smart way for us to continue to argue for populist type um, policies, but not to be reckless, not to be reckless with our policies, not to be reckless with our language, to be smart about it. And that doesn't mean to be timid. No one's ever going to call me timid. No. I'm going to go out and Joe Biden's a liar. I'm going to call him a liar. But there's there's a recklessness to some of the stuff that happened over the last four years, which came back to cost us suburban voters, which cost us the election, in my view, in 2020. So I want to try to lead the party in that way um, and, and be a messenger for that. And then after 2022 is over, we'll make a decision about whether we're going to run or not. But I certainly won't preclude it. And I'm also not going to be one of these people who's going to say, well, I'll wait to see what President Trump's going to do. You know, I'm not going to defer to anyone. Yeah. If I decide that it's what I want to do and that I think I'm the best option for the party and for the country. And I think if you say you're deferring to someone, um, that's a real sign of both weakness and indecision. And we've already got that in the White House. I don't think we need a Republican. <laughs> well, uh, first off, thanks so much for joining us, Governor. I was having some technical difficulties, but I could not miss this interview for my life. And uh, Josh led into the most important question I probably have. There are a lot of folks who are visiting Texas. There's already a lot of talk about who might be up, who might not be. Uh, you know, I know Marco Rubio also went down there. And one of the first questions I want to ask is, how did it feel for you to destroy Marco Rubio's campaign <laughs> live on stage at that debate? Well, let, let's say this. Um, it was certainly something, as you know from watching it closely, and I know you did, um, <laughs> that we prepared for. I mean, you know, we, we baited him the whole week. Um, you know, calling him the boy in the bubble and all the rest of that. And, and, and so we were hoping we'd get a question early because, and let's, let's make something clear. We were doing it because we knew that for us to survive, we had to go through Marco mm -hmm. um, for us to survive to South Carolina. Um, but I will tell you that night that when it's going on, I knew it was going well, but I didn't, you never know quite how well when you're the one up on the stage, right? You, you think, I can't believe he just said that for a third time. But you're like saying, okay, well, you're not seeing the split screen on TV or whatever. So at the break, I went down to the edge of the stage where you were allowed to talk to your family. And my wife and my two younger children were down there. And I said to her, so what do you think? She said, what do I think? She said, don't answer another question the rest of the debate. If they ask you another question, just say pass. <laughs> Because you can't do better than what you just did. So just stand there, smile, say you love America, and get off the stage. Because I, mean, I mean, truly, that could be probably the most electric moment I've seen in, in debate history on television. It was unbelievable how hard – the impact that that had, I mean, it was unreal, unreal performance. And it was, it was, it was funny because as I went to go back to my podium, um, as the debate was getting ready to start again, um, Donald Trump came over to me. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, don't ever get mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that poor little guy, I thought he was going to pass out. I thought I was going to have to catch him. <laughs> well, this, is, this is reason A1A why I want you to run for president. I, yeah. I, I've respected you forever. I think you'd make a hell of a president. But I, but I do think, if nothing else, one of the candidates on stage is going to be absolutely <laughs> annihilated by Chris Christie at some I think point. So. And I that's don't know a safe. That's a very safe bet. Yeah. Well, you know, we, listen, we come to play, fellas. I mean, yeah. if you're going to get on the stage, my view has always been, I mean, you know, one of the moments that I really love that didn't get nearly as much attention as, as the Marco thing was when in one of the debates earlier, Jeb brought up federal regulation of fantasy football. And I just couldn't like contain myself. I'm like, seriously, we've got terrorist attacks all over the world. We, we've got a dreadful economy. And seriously, Jeb, you want to talk, you want to know why people turn their TVs off? That's why. That's it. Federal regulation of fantasy football. I mean, and afterwards, you know, it got a little bit of attention. But I know that our team are like, that's going to be the moment of the debate when you're mocking. And it wasn't. I don't remember. Trump must have said something. Yeah, no. it was hard to get. It was hard to overshadow Trump at that stage. He sort of had, he was swinging a hot bat with the Rand Paul stage. stuff and everything else. Listen, you know, at any stage, it was very tough, too. And, and the, because the media was focused on him. 
And he's one of those, listen, he is a unique personality to ever have run for president of the United States mm -hmm. because he's the first guy who ever had 100% name ID walking in. 100% mm -hmm. name ID who That's wasn't right. the president. And, and, and it was name ID from like a fake show where he was like fake firing people. Yeah, right. You know? <laughs> and, and people, but people watch it, well, he could do that. He could definitely be president, you know? So it was very hard because how are you going to critique, you know, The Apprentice? It was very hard. <laughs> to do, you know? so it was easier to talk about Marco Rubio's record than it was to talk about Donald Trump's. Well, I noticed of all of the 2024 candidates, there's been this sort of pilgrimage down to Mar-a-Lago. You've not done that. You've decided to be your own man. Stay, I know you've got your professional life to deal with too, which probably precludes you from going all over the place. But, but walk us through that because I, you were so close to Trump. You were instrumental 